hello everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. Uh, today we are spanning many miles and have Vince Byler on. Um, you're all the way over in Cambridge um, in the United Kingdom. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell us how did you end up living and working there at Cambridge? I'm here to say that like all things, one thing leads to another. I, I didn't try to end up here. It just sort of happened, I suppose. Uh, probably the medium length answer is that I have a lot to thank. I have Cliff Schrock and Steve Russell to thank, I suppose, for, uh, for being here. Um, I was teaching a class at SMBI because of Cliff Schrock. He decided to take a chance on this 32-year-old person. Um, why, I don't know, but there I was. And I was teaching a class. Uh, he told me to teach a class called Old Testament Survey. Now, um, I enjoyed the Old Testament, and I felt like I knew factually quite a bit about it, you know, um, uh, from what the King James Version said, but not a whole lot more than that. And I was happily teaching the class, or I was preparing to teach the class, and I asked Steve Russell, who had been my teacher of roughly the same subject at uh, Faith Builders, uh, what books he uses to teach it by now. And he told me about a book uh, by Paul Borgman um, entitled um, Genesis, The Story We Haven't Heard. And this Paul Borgman, uh, Christian man, uh, teaches, he, I think he has a degree in English literature, and he teaches the Bible as literature. And what's the story of the Bible when you read it through the eyes of through, through a literary perspective? Um, and, and this has been sort of a, a more recent approach from the 1980s onward in, in biblical studies um, that they've been doing this. Some, some teachers of literature have been doing this. And so Paul Borgman was basically piggybacking off of their ideas and saying, hey, look, this isn't this neat. If you read the Bible as literature, it's actually really brilliant stuff. Um, you know, not just as moral advice or, you know, whatever the, the usual readings we give to it, not that those are wrong or that he's contradicting those, but just saying, what else is going on here? And that was just so interesting to me, completely opened my eyes to certain things that I just really hadn't paid attention to before. And because I was forced to teach it, I could have read the book and not been that effective, but because I was forced to teach it, um, I was then uh, very interested in what it had to say and, and what the biblical Hebrew was, because there's a lot of there's a lot of fun things happening. Like if, if you read the Gettysburg Address um, that Lincoln said, let's imagine, translate that to another language. If you know another language, translate into that language. Would it have the same power in that language as it has in English? So, I mean, Gettysburg Address starts out four score and seven years ago, our fathers bought forth on this continent a new nation um, and, and goes on. And it's, it's, it's sort of a neat little summary of some of the, the founding fathers and Lincoln's interpretation of founding fathers views and things like that um but not to digress there too far uh, things like um just notice how it starts out four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth like he, he's using all these these words that begin with the letter f um and, and it's it's an artful like if, if you unpack it it's sort of an artful way of saying something he could have said you know 80 years ago 80 you know some years ago, our, 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 um, the, the founding fathers did something, but the way he did it alliterated in, a, in an artistic way that, that went beyond just the simple message, the simple content of what was being shared. And what I'm trying to say, and, and doing it not very briefly, is that the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, does the same thing in many cases. I realized that by reading Paul Borgman, and then I was like, well, I need to learn some more. Thanks, Steve Russell. Thanks, Cliff. I want to learn more about this. And so that was really sort of my, um, the spark that got us started. And uh, I'm, I'm still working at it. Um, I haven't mastered the Hebrew language by any stretch, but it's very fascinating um, what's going on. And so that's interesting because I was in that class when you were teaching that uh, Old Testament survey at, at SMBI. And it stands out as, as a really pivotal class for me because you were helping me look at the Old Testament through a, a slightly different lens than I was used to. And that was really interesting for me. And I remember that. And um, intriguing enough, I was actually there in Cambridge uh, visiting you just before COVID came through and shut, shut a bunch of things down. But you're doing a, a lot of research, I, I would guess you would say, or, or classes. Can you tell us a little, what, what are you actually doing there at Cambridge? Yeah, so I started out with an interest so for my undergrad. Uh, to do my bachelor's, I started out an interest in the Hebrew Bible as literature. So I, I knew I needed to learn biblical Hebrew so that I could read it, I could understand it, I could interpret it through a, a, a literary lens. Um, and, and for one reason or another, I was like, okay, I can do that. Um, it didn't seem like that was good PhD material. That that's, was kind of something in the 80s that they did, and, and it works well for Christians to do, but um, there needs to be something else. So, so what are you going to do if you study the Hebrew Bible academically? And I call it the Hebrew Bible because people 
uh, you work with enough Jews, you don't call it the Old Testament, right? You have to call it something more neutral. Hebrew Bible works pretty well. Um, so, so, so what do you do in studying the Hebrew Bible? Well, there's a couple of other approaches. One, you could take more of a comparative religious approach, um, which is problematic to say the least for, for Christians of at least some faith. Um, I suppose it's even problematic for agnostics. I don't know. But, but the point is there are certain tracks that you go down in, in Hebrew Bible PhDs that didn't seem to be, be a fit. Plus I didn't find that to be that interesting. Um, and so I sort of settled on, I, I like manuscripts. And so really what I'm doing now is, is working on a, something rather opposite from literature. It, it may seem I, I'm focusing on manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible, the oldest ones we have, except for the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is about the 10th century AD coming out of Egypt, primarily Egypt, uh, Palestine, or so-called Palestine, it wasn't Palestine then, right? Land of Israel, um, Babylonia, um, you know, Iraq, places like that. Mm -hmm. And these old Bible manuscripts are very similar, but there are differences. And I'm working on some paratextual features of these manuscripts, like not the text itself, but like surrounding little notes that have to do with this manuscript. And um, and then working up a, a com I'm comparing them and saying, I think this manuscript is comes from the same scribe as this manuscript or this script. Whoa. This manuscript is rather different from this one. Trying to establish maybe scribal schools, uh, different approaches um, to the text and things like that. Um, nothing actually to do with the actual words of the text itself. Okay, whoa, that's fascinating. So you're doing, you're basically um, piecing together a historical picture of what it may have looked like when the scribes in different schools of whatever produced these manuscripts a thousand years ago. Yeah, that's the idea. So there is a lot of information and I sort of need some time to show you what I'm talking about before I can actually explain what it is I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and basically what it amounts to is this, you have the main text, the biblical text of the Hebrew Bible occurring in usual columns, um, very regulated. They, they knew what the text was. They knew how to transmit it. There were no problems with that. It wasn't like people were like, what text are we using? Or is this right? Is this not right? Mm -hmm. They were just very, very, very concerned, obsessive, like beyond obsessive to make sure they transmitted it correctly. And so they had all these little ways or even just showing off how well they knew the text. That, that seems to be the case in some, in, in some instances. So what they would do is beside a word that was maybe unusual. So they say, let's say you decide to spell the word Y, W-H-Y, with an I instead of a Y, right? You could do that theoretically. And you have a lot of these spelling differences in the Hebrew Bible. It's not standardized. You know, it hasn't been run through a series of modern editors. So it's spelled differently in different places. Same word, same meaning, different spelling. And they were like, we aren't just going to get the word right. We're going to get the spelling right. And we want to make sure that it's spelled this way here and not there. Like, don't confuse this, please. And so they would note in the margin, make sure you spell it this way. Or they had, they had shorthand notations. It takes a little to get onto how you read them. But they would say it occurs once or it occurs twice or it occurs this way and another way like that. And they might give you the reference for it or something like that. And so I'm comparing those. And that's what I'm calling paratextual features. I'm, I'm, I'm comparing those features which surround the Hebrew Bible text, but are not part of that text, mm -hmm. and um, to, to see uh, where they came from, or to see if I can relate certain manuscripts to other manuscripts. And I'm guessing doing that at the University of Cambridge is a, is a pretty nice place to do it. Like, are there a lot of universities doing this type of research? Like, you have access to the actual originals and, and things as well? Well, actually, what I'm doing is mostly working with manuscripts from St. Petersburg. Um, yes, we do have manuscripts here, and yes, this is a, a wonderful place to do it in Cambridge. Um, there are a lot of manuscripts, uh, but some of the best, oldest Bible manuscripts, ones that are most complete, are in St. Petersburg, Russia, of all places. Wow. Taken there in the 1800s by um, a Jewish uh, collector of these things, Abraham Firkovich. Hmm. And through one thing or another, he ended up giving them, or they were taken to the National Library of Russia in St. Petersburg, and they've been there ever since. Wow. So a lot of my manuscripts are from there. And so I do everything online and I'm, I'm reading manuscripts online. A bit of a follow-up on that then, you know, why do you feel studying biblical languages is important to begin with? I'll answer that partly by, by restating what I did say um, regarding what I read from Paul Borgman. So if, if you want to read the Hebrew Bible and really get into it, you, you sort of have to say, okay, 
English isn't going to cut it. I, I need to understand what they actually wrote and not the translation. Sort of like, sort of like you don't want to study the, I'll go back to my illustration, um, the Gettysburg Address in translation in French. You want to know it in English if you really want to get whatever it is that it was, hmm. to the best of the best of your ability. And so I felt for that purpose, I just really needed to study Hebrew. I, I couldn't just say, well, King James is good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me, whatever. I, I really needed to, to look a bit more carefully at what was happening there. So, so, so that's one reason that is very important, I think, if, if you really want to get to know the text and enjoy it. In the way that it's supposed to be read, you sort of have to read it in the language in which it was written. My excuse for doing this, I enjoy it, um, is that in most other fields, if you do something in academic, Makes it's like, well, if I'm studying to be a doctor and I decide not to be a doctor when I'm done, I really blew all that money. I, mm. I wasted it. Or you decide, you know, you're going to, I don't know, be an engineer and you decide not to be an engineer after spending all the money you wasted it or a lawyer or whatever. Well, here's the thing, a, a nice little catch for Christians. If you decide to study the Bible and end up not using your PhD in biblical studies, you didn't waste anything. So I'm I have something that no one else does. Um, I, it's always going to be useful. And so it's, it's, it's useful on a personal level. It can be useful on an academic level. Um, I enjoy it. It just, it ticks a number of boxes at the same time mm -hmm. in a way that a number of other degrees wouldn't, I suppose. And, and I, I guess I'm kind of happy about that. And I, and, I, and I like, I like the energy that I can get from that. I find that it's often easiest and best to talk to people who are at the same place in life that I am, you know, someone else that's, I don't know, in academics or that's, thinking through some Bible problem um, or struggling with it, you know, those sorts of things. Those are the people that I can connect with best on some of these deep issues for me. And there aren't many people like that from my past. I, I really can think of almost no one. So it, it's very lonely. And, mm -hmm. and that's probably more detrimental than, than anything else or potential for detriment because it's hard to stay in community when you're alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> COVID, I suppose, taught us that too, reminds us of that. So we're going to shift again uh, for my last question here. Um, can you share one thing you've learned from your studies that you think would be of interest to our general audience? Some, something in your research that you've found intriguing that you would like to share? In terms of the Hebrew Bible more generally, I'll point back to what I did talk about at the beginning with this Paul Borgman um, guy who wrote the book, the, the Genesis, a story we haven't heard. Uh, where there's there's a lot of wordplay in the Bible, so they didn't they didn't rhyme, rhyme wasn't a thing, but they used a lot of wordplay, in um, in intriguing ways, and sometimes just for fun, um, they, they they would use it um, over and over again, the same words, same sounds, similar sounds, um, partly because they could. Um, th there is no no deeper theological reason. It just, you know, sort of like the four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth. Um, it's just well done. Mm -hmm. It's well done. Um, and, and that's that. And, and so that's, that's an exciting or an interesting bit of information that we've, that's always passed me by. Um, and, but, but it's not just that, like the stories, I think if we read them carefully, um, and, and don't just do the Sunday school reading where we're like, okay, this is a moral situation. You know, this is moral instruction. Now I need to be like David and not like Goliath. I need to not do like Jonah, you know, because God tells you what to do, you'd better do it. And that's sort of our um, take on the book of Jonah. And well, let's, let's think about the book of Jonah for a bit. You know, from that song, when God tells you what to do, you'd better do it. Like Jonah, you'll find out the hard, hard way. And the idea is that if you don't do what God says, he'll finally hit you hard enough over the head until you do what he says. That's sort of the point we get. And uh, that isn't even the story of the book of Jonah. I mean, look at it closely. Uh, understand the context of the story. It's, it's not, I mean, not to be too obvious or not to be, assume everyone's stupid here, but it's not talking about us. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not that concerned. I'm not saying it can't apply, but it's not that concerned about us. It's talking about the Jews of that time period who were supposed that God actually loves the Assyrians these horrible Assyrians, God loves them too. Mm -hmm. um, how is this possible? I mean, Jonah is actually this man who's doing the right thing. He's like, I don't listen to God because I'm a Jewish nationalist or not even nationalist. I, I wish to preserve my people. How can you blame the guy? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to sacrifice myself so that these Assyrians are destroyed. I'm all about destroying Assyrians. This sounds like a good idea to me. And the book of Jonah is saying, how can God say, how can I do that? You know, all these people 
um, and also much cattle, which is how the book ends. Like he also cares about the cattle, like the strangest story you could ever imagine. And all we hear is in Jonah, you shall find out the hard hard way. So I think the point is, if in studying Hebrew, it helps to look at some of these things more closely. And I at least have been more attuned to these things than I was in the past, that um, these are not quick summaries of what we ought to do necessarily, but very complex issues that sort of require a lifetime to unpack, to think about, mm -hmm. to reflect on. It's an open-ended discussion is what you see a lot of in the Hebrew Bible. Um, the New Testament is somewhat different. That's a different thing. I'm not discussing that necessarily. But with so much of what you see in the Hebrew Bible is an open-ended discussion, an invitation to think about something on a much deeper level um, and where there is no easy solution or this is how it is supposed to be or now we solve the problem and can move on. It's something you live with, you sit with for a long time. And um, I, I think that's valuable for us to do as well, um, because if I think we do that, then we mimic those early listeners mm -hmm. and get closer to what the intent of the Bible is. Yeah, that's a, that's a great note to end on. Mm -hmm.